Welcome to life unrestricted. This is your show if you're sick of living a life controlled by food and exercise rules and if you're ready to learn how to accept yourself and enjoy the heck out of life. My gig is about body image, femininity, self-worth and resilience. Come on, let's walk side by side as we slowly step out of restriction misery and unlock our true selves. Your host, Merit Boxler, is a former national radio DJ, freelance journalist, speaker, and writer with a passion to make women feel good in their bodies. This is a show brought to you live from Switzerland. Lovely radicals. Hello. How good to be saying the words lovely radicals to you again. How are you all, lovely people? I've missed you. I really hope things are going great for you, wherever you are, whatever you do. It's been so long, and I don't know where time went. It's been more than a year since I've spoken into this microphone life. As you know, I've published all the episodes that I had pre-recorded before going into the eating disorder inpatient treatment, and that was more than a year ago. Feels weird. Like I forgot how to actually talk to nobody and everybody at the same time. But now that I do it, it feels kind of good too. So let today be the day that the silence is broken. And it will be broken manifold. The first part of today's episode will be the closing of a dark chapter and a rather dark year. And the other probably much shorter part, <laughs> will be me sharing some news that are exciting and terrifying at the same time. News that hopefully mark the beginning of a sunnier and more soulful chapter of my life. So, radicals, this one's going to be long and all over the place, probably with a million tangents and me burning through way too many words while trying to get my thoughts out. So, Decide for yourself whether you want to, you know, put up with it, bear with me. But I just need to get this off my soul. So let's do this. Oh, and by the way, I'll put in a flag right here telling you that this summer, so only after I left the treatment center, I got diagnosed to be on the spectrum, having what was formerly described as Asperger's syndrome. Only in recent years, apparently, have they found out how differently this manifests in females than in men. And now that I know more about it, I can make a lot more sense of my many rituals and soothing behaviors. You know, for example, plucking my armpit hair <laughs> to calm my senses, which is weird. My social awkwardness when I feel unsafe my cluelessness about the myriad of unspoken norms of social interacting, my general feeling of never being able to fit in anywhere, my lifelong tendency to always try to imitate what others did in order to blend in, my tendency to cover up my anxiety with aggression, and my tendency to hide behind this protective wall of outward self-confidence when really I have a severe lack thereof and have been feeling self-conscious all my life. Also my weird pattern recognizing abilities, heightened cognitive abilities, like picking up people's energies and inconsistencies of what they put out and what I pick up, the ability to see through other people's veneer, whether I want to or not, and usually, no, people don't want me to pick up what they leave unsaid. And, oh, by the way, the photographic and audio memory that I have, never forgetting anything that was said or stuff that I, I read. Then the internal counting when I feel anxious, for example. The utter inability to participate or even listen to small talk. The cluelessness as to how to do woman, the hypersensitivity to textures, sounds, smells, tastes, the hypersensitivity emotionally, so picking up every damn energy in every damn room and taking it on, 
the difficulty recognizing when my system gets overwhelmed, which it does far more quickly than I would like it to. And of course, yes, my disordered eating and exercise habits. So I just want this out right now so that maybe my rambling makes more sense. And also to tell you that I now get why I feel and actually am often so terribly misunderstood and feel lonely a lot of the times. It's because I simply am. Because my quote mask of self-confidence probably might give out a totally wrong impression about me, might put people off even, might leave them feeling threatened by my directness or my intenseness. I don't know. I often feel like a toddler in an adult body, way more fragile than I'd like to be, but also guarding a childlike nature that I actually quite like. Man, see, it's already getting complicated. But telling you all this helps me to feel less ashamed of what I'm about to tell you here. A lot of you lovely radicals have requested that I share my experience of the, the treatment, uh, the treatment center and stuff that I experienced there, but I just couldn't. I left that treatment center at the start of 2018 and ever since then, so for almost a year now, I've been battling shame, confusion, fear and a feeling of being very, very lost. I've basically dug myself into a hole, I've isolated and I've kept my mouth shut. I just couldn't talk. Why? First of all, shame. So much shame. There goes this privileged Swiss lady being lucky enough to live in a country where health insurance covers for her inpatient treatment. And now look at her. Failure that she is. All this money gone to waste for nothing. Also, shame because I feel like I would have so much love to be able to share a success story here. And now I can't be the inspiration I think I should be. And generally, I admit to feeling like a fraud for not being able to follow through with all the great advice that I've heard on my own show <laughs> from the best of the best people when it comes to recovery from disordered eating and exercise issues. Having all the advice up in my head and here on my show to re-listen to as many times as I want to and still having ED rule my mind makes me feel like the greatest failure in the world. And second reason for my silence was the fear that talking about it could also mean that someone might get triggered by something I say or saying the wrong thing. I was feeling very unsure about how much sharing would be useful or not useful. And honestly, I still don't know. I have to leave it up to you listeners to feel into yourself. Are you in a position to listen to this? Is it maybe not the time? I can only share my own experience without any harmful intent without wanting to make general statements without judgment just my own story as I merit experienced it and I know it's very delicate to talk about these things I'm fully aware of that and you won't ever hear me mention any numbers of weights or exercise details because I know how harmful that is but apart from that I think I just need to let it out. Something tells me we need to talk about what's happening in many eating disorder treatment centers out there just to open up a conversation. I don't have the solutions, but maybe sharing our experience might help to change something because I really, I really think something needs to change. I'm honestly not surprised anymore that the relapse rates are so devastatingly high. And I'm not surprised either that I came out of that treatment way sicker than I went in mentally, physically, and psychologically to this day. I don't want anyone to experience this. So I'll break my silence, but please do care of yourself, lovely radicals. If you're not in a place to hear this right now, just skip over the mocky part or skip over the entire episode. I'll be the last one to blame you for that. And oh, I almost forgot, but I have to mention the last reason why I never talked to anyone anymore and why I just remained silent, it was that I was afraid to talk. And hear me out, because I know that sounds weird coming from me. 
you know, someone you might think is not really easily silenced, but you might be very wrong there because that's exactly what happened. In that case, it was uh, the people at the treatment center. They put enormous pressure on me, or let's put it that way, I let them put pressure on me. Looking back, I see how messed up this really was. But as they knew that I was uh, a previously well-known person in my country and that I had a podcast, they wanted me to talk positively about them, you know, to be some sort of marketing tool for them, maybe. So when I expressed to them how awful I felt, how unseen, how unsafe and how not recovering, They didn't want to hear that. And when I told them that I uh, wanted to leave early after eight weeks, they told me that I would never recover. And they tried to scare me into staying. And when that didn't work, they wanted me to sign something that I wouldn't talk negatively about what went on in that treatment on my podcast. They were afraid that I would throw them under the bus I had never intended to do so. The only thing I wanted was simply talking about my experience, uh, which subsequently seemed impossible, even though I had never even thought of mentioning them by name or something like that, and I surely never will. I mean, I have decency, and I don't know. Just because it didn't work for me doesn't mean that it didn't work for anyone. What they do might indeed help some people. It just did not work for me. So after I came back home, I have uh, never recorded anything new. I just drippingly released the pre-recorded episodes to you and uh, kept my mouth shut. And then the most ridiculous thing happened. After releasing an episode, they called me. They actually called me up, making outrageous claims and accusing me of talking badly about them. When I asked what specifically they were referring to, they made a statement in German. I asked if they heard it exactly like that. And the director of the center said, yes, that they had people watching my space (laughs) and that those people had reported said statement to them. I tried to do this politely, Radicals, so I just kindly pointed out to them that A, my podcast was actually in English. So that statement could not have been heard on here. And B, that I had not actually spoken into this damn microphone since way before treatment. So would they just please get the fuck off my back? And that was it. I never heard from them again. But it freaked me the fuck out. So that contributed to me keeping silent. But not anymore. I noticed this pattern in my life and I'm... Not willing to let anyone silence me anymore. And if it means disappointing people or losing people or the threat of being rejected, okay, I'm done betraying my own truth. I'm no longer going to be loyal to others when it means having to give up the loyalty to my own truth. That's hindering any recovery efforts, no matter what one is recovering from. But geez, I'm off on a tangent already and I've not even started yet, damn it. (laughs) By the way, speaking of hard stuff and dark stories, I'm of course not just going to share sad or annoying or shameful stuff today. I'm also going to talk about what my next plan is, my next small plan. Even if I can't shake this eating disorder fully yet, I'm willing to pack it in my bag and take it with me. P.S., Yes, I have travel plans. Yes, I'm scared as hell, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's step through the mucky part first, right? And then I will share the exciting part of today's talk. Are you game? And uh, before I say anything else, I just have to right now interrupt my stream of consciousness and say thank you. Thank you to all the people who have kept my Facebook group, the wonderful space it always was. Thank you so much. Thank you for cherishing diversity, differences, and humanness in your posts. And thank you for encouraging each other on your own individual journeys. You're all wonderful people. And special thank you for all my Patreon angels. Some of you have stuck around and are still willing to support this podcast. 
which is amazing. <laughs> and this is what makes this possible, because without you, I'd really wouldn't have the means to try and continue this podcast. So for any of you out there willing to support Life Unrestricted, please go have a look on my Patreon page. You can support Life Unrestricted with any amount you like, no strings attached, and I'm forever grateful for all of your contributions. You'll find me on patreon.com slash life unrestricted because maybe, who knows, just maybe I could deliver an episode or two over the next few months if my exciting plans pan out and if some of you are you know, supporting the whole thing, feel free to come on board. No strings attached, as I said. No fishy business here. No episodes, no charge. You no longer enjoy episodes, you cancel. Easy. So, here we go. Here's the mucky part of this episode. As you know, I had had so much hope that this very big step for me of going inpatient would help me get out of this 20-year-old eating disorder. I was aware, of course, that it was going to be hard and heavy and I was fearful and certainly full of doubts. And sadly, there was no treatment center to be found that did not list, quote, treating obesity as one of their specialties, which I found not just enraging, but also very sad because it says a lot about the state of the whole conceptualization of bodies and what a shape of a body supposedly says about a person's state, which we all know is nothing. There are people with anorexia in larger bodies. There are binge eaters in very small bodies. There are healthy looking people with the sickest minds you could imagine. And I, yes, count myself right in that category. So realizing how weight centric this whole country and probably a lot of other places still are, you know, that was a sad realization. And since that was all there was to be had in terms of intensive treatment, I just had to go with it. And sure, I was proud of myself of stepping into the unknown like this, because it's not something I easily do, especially at my age, but I was really hoping to find life again. And since I had felt so lonely for such a long time, I was certainly hoping to find like-minded, deep-feeling individuals like me who were also hoping to get better, who were also hoping to find their voices, their deeper truths, and who were willing to, you know, step into their fullness. How naive. I was somehow thinking that everybody would be thinking like me and feeling like me. Ha! <laughs> Suffice it to say, that's not at all what I found. As you can probably guess by now, the whole thing was a mess. Parts of it were even traumatizing. Knowing now that I am on the spectrum, I understand why some of the stuff I saw so completely derailed me and uh, left me feeling unsafe, unstable, and uh, for a long time not really wanting to wake up again. But I can say that um, I'm pretty sure some of the stuff would have freaked out any person, let alone someone with an already freaked out and traumatized nervous system. So there you go. My initial plan uh, was to stay at the clinic for as long as it would take. I was willing to stay for half a year, even if that was what it was going to take for me to get out of my entrenched ways. But I ended up, as I said, only staying eight weeks as I decided to leave early because everything was just getting worse. And now before I get into more details, I want you to know that this whole story is not supposed to come across like I just want to whine and remain in some sort of victim mentality or do the blame game here, I realize full well that it must also have been that part of me that got so afraid and that felt so alienated that also made me at a certain stage of the stay lose the willingness to participate fully in whatever it was they offered. So first off, I went in with what is quite typical for people with eating disorders, I think. I felt not sick enough. I was in the, quote, normal BMI range on the lower end. But don't get me started on BMI. That's just no way to measure someone's health or the severity of an eating disorder. But just so that we know what we're talking about. So I was not feeling sick enough. But when I entered treatment, I knew that my body was too thin for my body. And I had such hopes that the treatment providers would let me finally relax 
from over-exercising every day, let me feel and feed the intense hunger that I was numbing with all this exercise and that they would let me eat as much as my body would ask for to heal, to get my period back and most importantly, to hold me when the freak outs would make me want to quit or run away. I was hoping that I would find people who know about body diversity and the nonsensicalness of BMI and fat phobia and how to hold their patients in the process of them gaining as much weight as their wonderful diverse bodies need in order to get the eating disorder out of their minds for good. I was hoping for education about how much life the pursuit of weight loss sucks out of people, how it drastically reduces a person's freedom and results in a total disconnection from their intuition and their body signals. I was hoping for body image work. I was hoping for positivity. And I was hoping for a strong sisterhood. I was dreaming about women connecting on a deeper level and holding each other emotionally when inevitably our demons would roar. I was hoping for safety and trustworthy connection, a stable ground from which to jump beyond the fears and the compulsions and the hell of an eating disorder. How else are you going to get over your worst fears? You gotta feel safe and seen in order to face them. And I found none of that. The first thing that happened was that the second I entered, all my baggage was taken from me and in front of me thoroughly surged while I was standing there, not even having arrived fully yet, you know. When I asked what all that baggage searching was for, they said drugs, artificial sweetener, alcohol, food. I was dumbfounded and quite shocked to find the insides of like every little thing I brought turned inside out and every pen opened up and, you know, It's quite surprising that they didn't examine my butt, for Christ's sakes. So little traumatized me was already in a hypervigilant state the minute I entered. I felt invaded, I felt unsafe, I felt unseen and like, hey, don't you guys trust me at all? You really need to... Oh my God. Yeah, wasn't cool. After all of my bags were searched, they left me... In a, in a cold, uncomfortable room to unpack my stuff. And I tried hard not to feel so goddamn anxious. And uh, when I came out, the first thing I saw in the hallway was a, a group of very young and terribly emaciated girls. And I immediately felt out of place. There were precious few women in bigger bodies there. And I found myself instantly gravitating toward them for some reason? Was I hoping that they would be more open to body positivity and body acceptance than the thinner ones? If yes, why? I don't know. But in any case, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that the women in bigger bodies got put on restrictive meal plans. Because apparently with them, they had to treat weight issues. Right. That's just so heartbreaking. And I found that they all, too, had internalized that whole narrative for so long that all they did, just like every other woman there, no matter what body they inhabited, was body bash themselves. Tell people how much they hated their fat and their unruly bodies. Everyone seemed to find camaraderie over that. Imagine, no one said anything. And what I also found out on the first day was that this treatment center wasn't just treating eating disorders, but also drug and alcohol addictions, substance abuse. Now that's great in and of itself, but I had no idea how much that would re-traumatize me. As you know, I do come from a very chaotic, very unstable and dangerous childhood with a mother that was alcoholic and reliant on pills to keep her going before she eventually committed suicide. So being around women and girls who were slumped on couches because they were on heroin substitutes, opioid substitutes, or heavy anti-anxiety medication, or when I witnessed women secretly drinking, or when I heard screaming in the hallways, or when I saw women black out and being sent home, or 
or when I sat across women with freshly bandaged cut wounds at mealtimes, all things I'm not judging because there's real suffering there. No one does things like that just for the fun of it, so please don't get me wrong. But it really freaked my nervous system out so bad that I felt completely unsafe and very much in danger all the time. Of course, I wasn't actually in danger, but that's how I felt. Talk about being an empath and feeling the negative energy of an entire clinic all at once. Right out of the gate, I couldn't sleep. I was constipated. I was afraid. Great. So I was already pretty much unable to relax. I felt like I was on high alert all the damn time. And hundreds of rules, the same rules for all of us, in this stupid one-size-fits-all way. Even though there was a plethora of mental health issues treated there, and it made zero sense to apply all the rules to every single person. As it was, zero individuality. So I was constantly anxious, feeling constricted, feeling watched, having my room raided, and when I just couldn't sleep anymore, all I got offered for that were heavy sleeping pills that I, of course, didn't take because I didn't want to get myself into a pill addiction on top of everything else while I was in there. I was generally appalled of how many meds they gave out, seriously. I mean, there were a lot of people and a lot of conditions, but I don't know, somehow it felt wrong the way they seemed to be okay with numbing people, but I don't know enough to talk about these things specifically. But what I can talk about is the fact that I didn't find anyone that I felt I could relate to. Nobody I could talk to about the specificities of my own disorder and fears, and certainly nobody to talk to about body acceptance. Everybody seemed to find that weird as an idea. Or someone to talk to about how women objectify themselves in order to be loved, or how women silence themselves by starving, or how much we could accomplish in the world, for example, if we just stood together and accepted our bodies, our diversity, and our unique greatness. No one, not one of the patients, let alone any of the treatment staff, had ever heard of health at every size. Most of the girls refused to eat the already ridiculously small meals that were on offer. Others pretended to have eaten, and going into the community bathroom in the morning to shower often put me face to face with someone's vomit in the bathtub. I don't know why, but it all scared me so much that I just felt tense all the time. I wanted to run for the hills when almost everyone I encountered wanted to talk about every gram they gained. And everybody seemed to want to be talking about their ill, tired, and small bodies with such hate, describing themselves as fat, disgusting, and needing to lose weight. What was also very disturbing to experience was that if you gained weight, like in my case was a planned thing, they wanted me to, to gain some weight, not too much, but a little bit, people kind of congratulated me because that meant that I could go home on the weekend, but I felt it was superficial, and I just felt how superior those women felt who did not gain weight. Because if one week I did not gain weight, they looked at me like a traitor and a threat. It was that impossible thing of not being able to do it right. I witnessed skeletally thin women claiming they were not sick, just because they still got their period. And I witnessed others in that state who told everyone how they really, really tried to gain weight, but somehow lost again. And you just knew that they were lying. And it was never their fault. Always some other circumstances fault. And I so wished our fears could have been openly and honestly talked about, you know, but the tricks, the lies, the deceit, the superficiality, and boy, the competition at that place was so intense. It really was too much for me. I didn't understand how no one seemed to see how much easier a time we could have had if we were honest with each other, honest about our fears, our, our belief systems, and who we had learned all that stuff from. 
Instead, the only thing I ever heard shared was details about their specific eating disorder behaviors. Who was able to eat the least, who walked or ran the longest time, who did whatever they did. And so I never really opened up about what, you know, the exact behavior patterns of my eating disorders were. Not just because of shame, but because I know how damn competitive eating disorders are. How ruthless the eating disorder mind twists any mention of numbers and weights and calories, all that stuff. So I kept all that to myself, not wanting to trigger anyone. But I was constantly feeling triggered myself. Because as it happened, I was hearing this talk all the time. And I had to realize that my psychological barriers, my soul membrane, if you will, just wasn't robust enough to keep that stuff out. I thought it would be, but not a chance in hell. For one thing, as you know, I am a hypersensitive human being. That in and of itself is a cross and a blessing at the same time. But it certainly was the worst feature to have at this clinic, since I literally picked up all the negative energy around me nonstop, as I said, and I couldn't defend against it for long. It just seemed to seep into me. It was pretty clear early on that I didn't fit into any of the groups that formed, and it didn't take long for me to keep to myself almost entirely. And by that I mean completely to myself. Sometimes I felt like I was the only one without a family or friend support from the outside, and since internet use was extremely restricted, which is a good thing, I know that, but I could not reach out really. And of course, I felt my spirit break. Of course I did. Because, you know, starting out, I was determined to eat whatever they served. Even though I personally hadn't eaten during the daytime for decades. So I was very, very fearful and very brave. When for the first few weeks, I just ate bravely. And then I felt my hunger come back. And I felt hungry all the time. And when I asked for more food... They said no. <laughs> they actually said no. They said that their allotted calorie amount was enough for an adult woman and that anything over that would be called a binge. Something that was to be avoided at all costs, something that one was punished for by not being able to go home on the weekends or having the room raided, stuff like that. Instead of something to eat, I got the advice to distract myself. What the actual fuck? It was exactly this kind of thinking that got me into my eating disorder, distracting myself from feeling hungry, overriding my body's signals. And here they were telling me to keep on doing that. I once went to the village to buy two rolls of bread to eat before going to bed, you know, I was doing that in secret because I didn't know what else to do since they didn't give me any food. And I felt I knew enough about eating disorders to actually take care of myself in that way, which in and of itself is so wrong when you think about it. I went to treatment, having to feed myself in secret, you know, on a forbidden basis. So what happened when I got back? Right, they searched my bag and there went another weekend with the off chance to see one of my few close friends. Another example? We couldn't keep more than a few hundred calories in our rooms because of the, quote, danger of binging. A, I don't believe in the theory that you can prevent binging from happening by restricting someone's food. We all know what happens when you do that. You binge. <laughs> and B, the calorie amount that we were allowed to have in our rooms was so low that when they felt like it, they would just raid your room and count your cappuccino powder, your chewing gums, and your sugar sticks for your tea, and there went another weekend. I quickly realized there that eating what they served me basically only meant leaving the table hungry anyway, and by that time my determination flew out the window, and I started only eating half of what was served too, just like the other girls from across from me who pretended to be chewing when really they hadn't put anything in their mouths. And you know what the saddest thing is, radicals? It seems to be that even a 44-year-old eating disorder brain is still very susceptible to outside influences. 
even to those I logically vehemently disagree with. And even after all the work that I've already done, it really all slowly came undone. What happened was that I found that my mind and my thoughts turned pretty dark, as in I let in very foreign, very disempowering patterns, like comparing myself to others, considering myself surely not sick enough, looking at emaciated young girls and having the thought pop into my head that if I only had more discipline, I could be thin like them. It is really, really painful to have this happen, and it's very embarrassing to admit. But this needs out. I would never in my life have imagined that this would happen to me. But I found myself judging skinnier girls in my mind, judging them for their deceit, judging them for their ways of judging me when I gained weight or didn't gain weight. And I was looking to those women with more meat on their bones, hoping they would be more body positive than they of course could be. And I found myself having competitive thoughts in all directions, you know, eating disorders of the worst kind. And I just ended up spiraling. It's so ugly to admit all of what I'm saying. But that's what happened. Suddenly I was convinced that while I wouldn't have to lose weight, I also didn't need to gain weight, thinking that, my eating disorder felt safer than actually engaging in all this negativity there. You know, stuff like that. Totally illogical eating disorder thoughts. As I said, I started to compare what other girls did to what I did, thinking that I was just a greedy woman, having to control my hunger. I was starting to compare myself, as I said, to emaciated girls who went walking every chance they got. I saw them walking off every calorie, making rounds around the area, around the building, each with their eyes glued to the ground, walking, you know, all solitary by themselves, moving their arms to burn some more. And suddenly I found myself wanting to walk more than those super skinny girls because they were thinner already, right? And I already ate more than them. And, and I became one of those lone compulsive walkers and at the same time, I was hating myself for being so weak, for not being able to rest as I had intended to. At the same time, I felt so alienated around the people inside the facility that I couldn't wait to leave the building every chance I got, which of course perpetuated the problem with being the odd one out, because I proved myself right. I was the odd one out. It was a mess. In the weeks when I gained weight within the planned range they had assigned for me, I was allowed to go home. If not, I was not allowed to go home. The shitty thing was, of course, that I always gained weight whenever I was home because I was with people who just ate freely and I had less comparison when I ate alone. So I actually just enjoyed eating more and I really ate heaps on the weekends when I was home. And when I was in treatment, I often lost it again and was subsequently not allowed to go home the following weekend. Another mess. Most other girls I witnessed, they came back from their weekends having lost weight because they didn't eat on the weekends, but they gained it again within a week. So they were able to go home again just to restrict. And again, I'm trying hard not to judge or put any blame on anyone. I'm just describing what I perceived and how that affected me. Because I'm aware that I was also part of why it didn't work out for me at that clinic. I'm aware of all that. And really the one thing that still hurts me to this day is the feeling of alienation I felt there. As I said, being treated and feeling like the odd one out. And I really hated to observe all the gossip and backstabbing that was going on between the girls and women. And boy, it really hurt my heart when I entered a room and a group of girls just stopped talking and looked at me with this utterly unwelcoming look on their faces. So I lived through this old feeling again that I remember so well of never fitting in anywhere. Not good enough for the women with bulimia, not good enough for the people with anorexia, not good enough for those in bigger bodies who were brainwashed into having to lose weight and gain control of their eating. 
Not belonging anywhere is very, very painful psychologically. We know that for anyone. And it certainly took a toll on me. And you know what the worst was? The supposedly, quote, strong merit was so confused and so lost that I actually let girls half my age bully me. I was so desperate to belong somewhere that I totally betrayed myself and my boundaries and I found myself in positions where I would apologize for nothing or try to appease someone bullying me instead of speaking up for myself or get angry. It pains me to remember that I behaved like a beaten dog trying to make eight-year-olds, you know, gossiping girls not to target me trying not to intimidate them with my presence, with my knowledge, with my life experience or my shine or my meanness. It felt like beneath the veneer of my adultness, behind my seemingly take-no-bullshit facade and strong voice, I was just a small child with scraped knees and a snotty nose who just needed parents and friends and not having either of the two. I had to internally block out the pain over the fact that no one ever seemed to want to know how I really was doing or someone who would have been interested in the funny, colorful sides of my personality, my depth, my philosophical nature, my critical mind. And as I was starting to try to please everyone and be more superficial and unthreatening, you know, trying hard and awkward to engage in their small talk, I completely forgot my inner child, my authentic self, and I let people roll all over me. So, as I said, I couldn't relax, I couldn't find comfort, and I couldn't feel safe. And above all, from the perspective of the treatment itself, I found it very unhelpful that the focus was so much on BMI, weight, and calories, and portions. It really only made me more afraid of food and weight. And really what I needed was someone to hold my hand and give me full permission to eat as much as I truly wanted until my hunger normalized, someone to hold my hand through the mind-fucking process of gaining weight. But since what they served was not enough for what I truly wanted after 20 years of dieting and over-exercising and restricting, it just felt like a joke to even participate. There really was no joy whatsoever in eating. Time restrictions, talk restrictions, condiment restrictions, amount restrictions, choice restrictions. I understand why, but for me, all that really didn't work. I had hoped to be reconnected to this innate joy of eating and getting help with the fear or the guilt for eating past fullness or for not being able to compensate, stuff like that. But I got the feeling that food at that clinic was treated more like a necessary evil than one of the greatest joys in life. And hearing about calorie plans, food groups, and portion sizes in those group sessions, I hated all that. It was like I was poisoning my brain. How could that be helpful when it was the exact stuff that got us all into the eating disorder? Isn't it insane to try to get people out of an eating disorder brain by focusing on the exact things that got them into that kind of thinking? I really don't get it. Why doesn't treatment focus on critically questioning the beauty ideal? On what it was that made us patients think that our bodies would be the ticket to feeling worthy? Or focusing on the truth of size diversity? Or how about focusing on body acceptance? Or on finding safety within oneself? or on establishing a peaceful relationship to one's uniqueness and finding peace with one's imperfections and seeing that we all are just human beings, each and every one of us with our own struggles. And why not teach girls about comparison and the awful effects of it? Why not teach the patients about the effects of social media? Why not educate girls and women about feminism Why not teach them about media literacy and about seeing behind all the purposely self-esteem destroying messages of the media and the advertisement industry? Why not teach patients about the fuckery that is the billion dollar diet industry? Why not tell all the eating disorder sufferers, including the binge eaters for Christ's sakes, that dieting leads to deprivation driven binge eating, that it is the restriction that needs to go? 
and then more dieting and calorie restriction and portion control will only worsen their problem and make our minds more toxic. Why not teach us skills about how to improve our body image without having to change our bodies? How to de-brainwash ourselves from believing we have to look a certain way to be loved? How about talking about gratitude? Why didn't anyone talk about meditation? How about cheering for other women? Huh? Why didn't nobody talk to us about women building strength from standing with each other instead of despairing with constant comparison and competing with each other to the detriment of us all? Why isn't there more empowering? I, you know, I've come to hate that word as it's been so overused everywhere, empowering, empowering. But you know what I mean when I say that. So, long story short, by the end of December 2017, I left. I left that center desperate to want to spend Christmas at my friend's place and feeling free again and feeling safe and finally being able to sleep again and go to the bathroom normally again and just to get out of that toxic environment. And for the first few weeks, it was just me swearing to myself never to skip breakfast again and to let my stupid elliptical be for a while. And even though I realized it, I couldn't stop the old pattern from slowly re-emerging. The walks that were compulsive rather than enjoyable to begin with got longer and longer again, and I became fearful of breakfast again because my eating disordered brain found that my nightly binging didn't justify breakfast, you know, completely ignoring my intellectual knowledge that I was only binging because I wasn't eating enough during the day and because I moved too much. I knew all that. But, you know, all that stuff that I was exposed to at the treatment center, it was just also in my head. And I was alone. So my gremlin had me on all fronts. If I ate more during the day, it made me feel awful since I still binged at night. And if I didn't, it made me feel awful for not doing better while knowing better. A royal shame spiral. For a while, I volunteered at a bistro with other people with psychological handicaps because I thought that would uh, make me eat more during the day. But no, instead, my routines got worse and more torturous. And my eating disorder brain was almost stronger than before that. And all the disordered rules just kind of draped themselves around my working schedule. I gained some weight. Uh, no one seemed to think that I should be gaining more as I looked, quote, totally normal to the outside world. And shame had me in its grip again, as it does almost all the time. <laughs> I found myself unable to talk about all this for fear of being perceived as a complete fraud. Because when I did, people tended to react in a totally un understanding way. You know what I mean? Like, why should you be gaining weight? You look okay. Why do you want to walk less? W walking is good. What, what's wrong? I wish you could eat your amount. It look, you're fine. I don't know. It's just, <laughs> it never felt good to talk about it. And I couldn't talk about it here for reasons that I already stated. And so I just felt weak and like a failure for not having more success and for not, you know, just doing better and for having problems <laughs> generally. And really, I still feel quite horrible about it. And I can safely say that sadly, 2018 was, was lost to the eating disorder demon in my head. And it really didn't help that this summer, uh, 2018, uh, I was misdiagnosed with appendicitis and got a surgery that later proved to be unnecessary. And not only that, but actually two surgeries because the first surgery went wrong and they had to put me under another time two days later to cut me open again and fix the mistake they made. And uh, it's really almost too much to talk about because... They really messed with my body and with my mind, and they didn't believe me when I told them about my eating disorder. The surgeon actually said, uh, 
well, you can hardly have an eating disorder, you look okay, and I don't know about the exercise addiction, poking my legs as I lay helplessly before him, you certainly aren't muscular, and you seem to have another problem altogether, wiggling his hand at the right side of his head, indicating that I was a basket case, basically. This is no joke. First-hand mental abuse in a hospital from the chief surgeon after two surgeries that I never really needed and that really took me months to recover from, especially psychologically. It was horrible. Speaking of feeling unsafe in a hospital, it all felt truly traumatizing all over again. And again, after that, I was afraid non-stop. I don't know how to describe this feeling, but after that I felt like a trapped animal. It might sound like I'm over-dramatizing things, but really it isn't. I also didn't know about being on the spectrum back then, so that didn't make things easier or more understandable for myself. I just know that I felt hit from fate from all sides. And after leaving the hospital, I had a huge belly from all the surgery and healing. And I got so hung up on that, that I started walking basically all day. During the worst of summer, during those terrible heat waves here in Europe, feeling horrible, horrible and stressed out and weak and compulsive, yet unable to stop. Also, I felt desperately lonely. So I found myself only siding with my eating disorder more because it seemed to provide safety and structure. It's so wicked. I did take some action though. Not on the eating disorder front directly because I just couldn't, but on very important other fronts because I saw a pattern emerging that I hadn't fully been aware of before. When I'm feeling vulnerable or I am in situations where I perceive myself to be dependent on other people, I'm very easy prey for gaslighting, covert mental abuse or manipulation, especially the sort that makes you question whether you are the one at fault or you are the crazy one. I don't know if you know about that sort of abuse. In such moments or with such people, I tend to fall for the superficial niceness of somebody, for their empty promises, for example, or their promised kindness, or simply for the threat of having their kindness and approval withheld from me. I remember with that surgeon in hospital, I really tried to appease him and to to be nice to him when all the time his abuse got worse and worse while I lay there in, in the hospital bed. And I could not stand up for myself. I I, I couldn't get angry, nothing. I just, it was just like the beaten dog all over again. It was horrible. So I tend to not want to see what's really going on, just to not lose someone or someone's approval or someone's kindness. And no one really suspects that with me the outwardly confident and well-spoken and supposedly boundaried persona. Nobody would. Even I get fooled by my protective mask of confidence. Inside, though, I know why this mask is there. It is there because it is protecting a very soft core, a very insecure core. And that core is prone to attract people who overstep my boundaries especially when I don't feel them myself, because that core lets them overstep my boundaries. It just wants to be loved after all, and it was never taught to put up boundaries, let alone enforce them. That stuff, I found, can happen in all sorts of relationships, as I said, in hospitals, also with bosses, with friends, loved ones, family people, business relationships, everything. So what I did was I finally, finally cut ties to my doctor, my OBGYN, and my therapist. For a long time, I just stayed with this team because I didn't want to see that they never really helped me with their crazy diet and exercise advice. I didn't want to see how toxic it was for me. First of all, because my doctor always called me, my dear And that made me kind of think she truly cared and that I should take her advice and wisdom to heart. See the pattern again? 
Also because I didn't know how to find a whole new set of healthcare providers and mental health specialists to trust. I certainly didn't know how much better it could actually be, or I would have long ago found me another set of professionals to turn to. Who knows, maybe there was a little bit of an old belief in there too that I didn't deserve better. So yay me! I finally took the plunge and went and found me another primary care physician, a new OBGYN and endocrinologist, a new psychiatrist and psychotherapist. Thank God we have this kind of wonderful health insurance system in Switzerland. It sure is a privilege, you know, to get therapy covered. Not everybody has that. With my new therapist, I found someone who is extremely present, non-judgmental, surely body positive in his very nature and very compassionate, surprisingly also a man. I don't believe I've ever met a man this kind and present. It's like seeing the sun when you've been sitting in the basement the whole time. And I don't feel dependent on him, funnily enough. It's just, it feels healthy. And at the same time, when I'm with him, I can really, really open up. I, I don't feel judged for anything I say. Not what I eat, not what I do, not how I feel, not my, my darkest, darkest thoughts. It's just, I don't know, in warm hands. And with him, these patterns have really come to the surface in our talks. The painful neglect of my own boundaries, the betrayal of my inner child and my truth in order to be loved. So, for example, with my father, who's now completely estranged, I've already done before, you know, you've heard me talk about him, I think. I've already done a ton of work on him years ago, and I really thought I had found a place of forgiveness. Isn't that a word we all strive for, right? What I didn't realize is that there still was this little girl inside of me hoping that by me, now approaching him with kindness and generosity, he might finally be able to, quote, see me or to care for me or to see my value and to finally be some sort of father for me. And sure enough, I let him hurt me all over again. (laughs) When I went into treatment last year, he suddenly reached out with the sweetest of promises too. This time he said he would really support me and do all he could to help me recover. Well, I threw all caution overboard again. Little tiny me inside of me was really hoping that this time it would work. I felt how badly I needed him and there he went and let me down in the worst ways possible. When after my treatment experience, I returned back home and was dealing with thoughts of, you know, the very dark nature. And I told him that I was struggling very, very much. And because he only ever cared about me when it seemed to suit his needs, or just to hear himself say, what a supportive father he was, only to vanish again. He did just that. He just said something to the effect of, chin up, girl. And I never heard from him again. (laughs) I mean, who does such a thing at the worst time in someone's life, let alone their daughter? He really managed to totally ignore that I was feeling so much closer to death than life, and he just disappeared. Three months later, of course, as he always does, he reappeared, wanting me to instantly be ready to go for coffee with him because guess what? It suited him and he was in the vicinity saying that he missed me. You really need to have to go around and around on this carousel of trickery and fundamental emotional abuse to finally recognize it and it was time for me to recognize it. Because when he comes back, he always does it with the sweetest smiles that made little me inside my soul melt and have her hopes up for fatherly love all over again. And this time, finally, this year, after having experienced this last great display of betrayal of my trust and this unspeakably painful letdown, the blinders just sort of fell off. I knew that no matter what I would ever do, nothing would ever change. He was always only going to deliver sweet empty promises and not ever be committed and reliable. 
And I saw how dangerous it really was for me to trust him, especially in states of great vulnerability, when I really am in need of support. That's the worst time to deal with that kind of guy. So this long coming final realization made me able to not letting this sort of sophisticated emotional abuse from him happen again, not again, like a million times before, let my own boundaries crumple to the ground just because I get overpowered by this need for my father to be reliable and a source of love. So when around my birthday this fall, he got back to me (laughs) with his ridiculous sweet nothings in hopes to get his needs of instant coffee met, I almost laughed out loud at the ridiculousness of this whole game. I learned enough about covert narcissistic abuse to come to expect just that. I knew that he would never truly care about me and my well-being, that there would never be actions to match his words, that he would never truly face the fact that he continuously hurts people. I knew that the only thing that matters to him is to look good, to get away clean, and that I would never find justice with him. And really, there was not one ounce of respect left for that guy. And I got angry. And I was finally able to just tell him on the phone that I saw through his pitiful spiel and that I was so sick of tiptoeing around him just to not upset him and confront him with his bullshit. And that that was it for me. I wasn't having it anymore. And would he please stay out of my life for good? And guess what this gentleman told me? Three words, only three words but three times. He told me his adult daughter, fuck you, girl. I remember how I got off that phone call that took so much courage to make and quite literally losing my shit, crying. Everything in me screamed from pain, from shock also. You know, I've never had any, anyone, let alone my father, tell me, fuck you, girl. That's just, that's a lot. And I knew him being the narcissist that he is, that he would probably right away go and tell his girlfriend how he was the victim, that he really tried so hard and that I was just an outrageous, ungrateful bitch and basically a sick human being. Don't we all know it? And still to this day, I have those moments, horrible moments, when doubt creeps in, when my mind tells me, What if he's right? What if I am asking for too much? What if I am just a sorry afterthought of a human being? What if I am just a sick human being? What if I am not worthy of his love? Narcissistic abuse is so hard to deal with because you constantly doubt your own sanity and your deep knowing of the truth, especially if it's covert and all wrapped up in this charming way that my father is so skilled at playing. It makes it really hard not to fall for that bait and to see it for what it is. And it is ruthless self-interest. There never was and there never will be any love, just empty promises. People like that can manipulate you so subtly, their twistings of the truth can be so wicked, And they have a way of playing others so cleverly that it's really hard to to trust one's instinct. That feeling that tells you that this is wrong and that this has nothing to do with love or any sort of authentic, interesting connection. And heaven forbid you call them out on their game. The wrath of God descendeth upon thee. And all they're really concerned with is remaining clear or unblameable in any way. And having things go their way and looking good to the outside world. So good luck with them, horrible bunch that they are. So if any of you has ever experienced that sort of abuse, let me tell you, I hear you. It's hard. And having that thing happen to you, especially over a long period of time, makes it so hard to trust yourself again and your own knowing. I still struggle with that and I constantly doubt myself. You're not alone. Yet with my father, as I said, there came this point of complete and utter fed-upness and that made it almost 
not easy, but you know what I mean, almost easy in a way, because I just suddenly felt in my bones that I would never want anything to do with such a human being at all ever again. It was just like a final wake up and no way in hell could I unsee the truth, as painful as it was. What was much harder for me and still is harder for me to deal with is the part with my only other family member, my aunt, because I saw a similar disrespect of my boundaries and unhealthy entrenchment happen with her. But with her, and this is what makes it harder, with her I know that she loves me and that she always meant well. That makes establishing and above all keeping up boundaries infinitely harder because I had always perceived her as, you know, the only real relative I have, my only quote unquote family in a way. So I felt dependent on her love from the get go, feeling like I was nothing without her and owed my life to her basically. And all of that made me pretty much blind to the less nice things that happened. For example, remember I told you about the surgeries that weren't necessary in the first place this summer? And, well, again, she only meant, well, but A, it was actually her that basically forced me to go to hospital because she was so worried about me being in such pain that she traveled to my city and actually rang me out of my flat and she totally disregarded my truth because I felt that hospital wasn't necessary, even though I was in extreme pain. But she wouldn't have any of that. And I understand that. I probably would have taken a loved one to hospital too. But still, I told her that I didn't want to go and she just made me go. But the fact is that I disregarded my own clear feeling and intuition that hospital wasn't necessary because I put her knowing above my knowing. And I already told you what happened after that. On top of this, when the surgeon in the hospital obviously verbally abused me, she once was there in the room with me when that happened. And instead of taking my side and defending me in any way, you know, because I was in a very vulnerable state back then, she actually said to him in front of me, yes, I know, she's difficult. But the worst is yet to come. I didn't recognize that for the betrayal that it was. It flew right over me. It felt awful and wrong, sure, but I couldn't point my finger to it because unconsciously, I agreed. I agreed to her, thinking, well, yes, I am difficult, so she's right. No wrongdoing there. And only after I processed the whole miserable hospital trauma and therapy, the thing with my aunt came up again, and I started crying because I realized how often I silently agree with people talking that way about me. So, of course, I didn't notice it consciously, and I didn't stand up for myself or talk back because I can't talk back to her, right? That would mean risk being abandoned by my only family. There were so many of those examples that just piled on top of each other where I just forgot to be loyal to myself in order to be loyal to her, her values, her opinions, and her treatment of me. No boundaries, no awareness, because every time I crossed her, every time I tried to get to the bottom of something that hurt me, every time I pointed out to her that she couldn't treat me like that, or would she please not treat me like that, she A, reacted very defensive and aggressive, saying she could very well say what she wanted to me, and I didn't get to, quote, emotionally blackmail her, of course, thereby silencing me right away. Speaking of emotional blackmailing, you know what I mean? Or B, she just gave me the much feared silent treatment. The contract always being you pivot or else. And I always fulfilled that contract because her love was all so important or so I thought. Fact is, she knew exactly how to avoid her own blind spots or how to avoid to allow another person to have their own boundaries. She knew exactly how to silence me, and I allowed it. It always takes two to dance a toxic dance. I'm fully aware of that now. But it also happened this summer that it was just suddenly too much. 
I could no longer dismiss my pain about what kept happening, so I did enforce my boundaries, and the predictable reaction happened. Complete disregard of my expression of, hey, this hurts me, please stop doing that. You know, I did I statements in a non-combative way, but again, she accused me of emotionally blackmailing her, which I then clearly and suddenly recognized for what it was, gaslighting putting me in the position of the attacker when trying to let her know that I was hurting. Like, who was I to tell her what she can say to me and whatnot? You know, for a long time, I was simply in denial of that pattern because it really is painful to wake up to it. But this summer, it hit me like a ton of bricks and I realized that I would not have a snowball's chance in hell to recover if I kept betraying my truth like this. Because this pattern bleeds out into so many things that I do. I'm so used to disregard my own feelings and needs and boundaries or not even feel them because my upbringing had me primed to do these things in order to survive. And so I never really learned to listen in and ask myself or to recognize what my own true needs are and to honor my feelings. It's easier for me to disregard them in order to have someone be quote-unquote okay with me. And that, of course, is exactly what happens when we try to please others by manipulating our body size, when we hope to be more lovable when skinnier, or more lovable when we're conforming to outside ideals, or more lovable when we're trying to be someone we're not. The problem is, the less we are in alignment with our true self, the less okay we feel. That's why no matter how much weight we lose or how much fame or wealth we try to achieve, we never feel whole. For me, being so used to adapt, to blend in, to try and not attract negative attention or to disregard my feelings in order not to lose someone's approval, I'm also, of course, used to dismiss my hunger, my need for rest, my need to express how I feel, and basically to stuff down my authentic self, that it took me a long time to recognize how this pattern showed up in so many of my relationships, especially if I perceive them, as I said, of being of a sense to my survival. I thought it was more important to have people like me than having myself like me. And it's slowly dawning on me that I really need my own loyalty and my own love to survive, not some superficial, conditional outside approval. If I kept settling for relationships that were based on my silence, having to stuff down my feelings or my pain or my other opinions or my different needs just in order not to be abandoned, I will continue to orphan myself over and over again. But let's be real, it hurts like hell, because I was actually looking for more people surrounding me rather than fewer, right? Since going for days without any social interactions, except maybe with my therapist and having no job, almost feels unbearable at times, so that makes me vulnerable. Again, easy prey for people who overstep my boundaries. And all of that, of course, makes my disordered eating and exercise behavior seem like the only thing I have left to keep my world from unraveling. Lack of connection really hurts the soul. And as I said, it's especially tricky with my aunt knowing how much I owe to her. It's this typical conundrum of feeling very grateful for someone and at the same time realizing that I often silence myself to please her or try to mold myself into someone she could approve of and how I always lacked the courage to enforce my boundaries, how often I felt less than when I was around her because she's so academically decorated, she has traveled the world, and I felt like my interests and my quirky, weird, and sometimes outrageous nature was never living up to her somewhat elitist ways. Maybe some or even a lot of you can relate, I don't know. But I sure felt like I let her down by not having these academic credentials, by not having a high-profile job or high income, and certainly by being stuck in an eating disorder that made whatever life there was before shrink away to a regrettable little prison, especially one that I basically created for myself. That made me like a total failure. What a shame for the family. 
see the shame spiral here? That's never conducive to create and uphold healthy boundaries. So when my therapist explained to me that it's often the people that claim to mean well that hurt us the most, I found it so unfair that my aunt seems to be completely unwilling or unable to get to the bottom of this with me because it really looks like she's only willing to continue our relationship on her terms and she's not willing to invest in our relationship and to acknowledge her own blind spots. Because also it takes two to establish a healthy relationship and seeing that she's not up for that and that she quite rudely turned down my kind invitation to work on things with neutral help, well, that hurts. And sadly, it feels a lot like abandonment all over again. Her silent treatment has been lasting for almost half a year now. And what used to happen was that at one point I would pivot. I would call her an A, just act all pleasant and as if nothing had happened, not mentioning any of it again, or B, apologize for nothing, mind you, just to have her in my life again, because I felt so lonely. And that alone shows how conditional this love was, how dependent on my betrayal of myself. I'm not on board for that anymore, because that's just buffering pain. So yes, as opposed to with my father, losing her hurts me deeply. I love her, and I miss parts of our connection. But if that means us interacting in a toxic way, that's no longer an option. I cannot feel safe around someone who is able to lure me in with paper-thin sweetness just to turn on me when I'm not agreeable or when I'm not reacting in the exact way they want me to. And a person I don't feel safe with doesn't really deserve my trust and vulnerability, right? But it took a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist to get me to see why these emotional abuse cycles happened to me so often and why I was so vulnerable to covert narcissistic abuse. It was so hard to face, and yet I could no longer deny it. It showed up in so many places. Just people who consciously or unconsciously were able to manipulate me by having their finger on the love slash approval button, you know what I mean? On, off on, off. And since we can never change other people, and we sadly can't make them see our perspectives and our boundaries or have them accept our boundaries, it is our responsibility, in this case my responsibility, to be my own loyal partner. That's the only way to start finding out who I really am without all those conditioned patterns. It's my responsibility to stop feeding the pattern but before the truth can set us free, we need to recognize which lies are holding us hostage, right? The lies that I had internalized in this case were stuff like, I am the one to blame. I am the fuck up. I'm a disappointment. I'm a lesser being. If I am just regular old me, no one will love me. I better hide. There's a paywall between me and love. Everything in life must be hard gained. If it comes easy, it's not worth much. Or taking up space physically, mentally, or psychologically, you know, metaphorically speaking, will cost me dearly. And maybe the deepest one of them all is, it is hard to love me. When we really stop to look, life actually does reflect back to us what we subconsciously believe. It's a hard thing to face, but once you start to pay attention to how your relationships work, what they're based on, how conflicts get resolved or not, how the power dynamics play out in, you know, the way of communicating, there are so many patterns we can start to recognize. I had and still have some very uncomfortable work to do, spotting and decoding the social contracts I've silently been agreeing to, mostly to my detriment, thereby reinstating my old belief systems, you know, proving my negative beliefs true to myself over and over again, and repeatedly playing out these old patterns. It takes guts to allow yourself to become aware of what's happening, You'll probably, as I do, recognize those patterns everywhere in your life when you start paying attention to it. 
I've also lost contact to other people whose relationships to me depend on me always having to initiate contact, me always having to be the one to start resolving upcoming conflicts, me having to shoulder the emotional baggage. You know the kind of relationships, right? There were a few in my life where I knew deep down that they were based on me behaving in a certain way so as to not to lose them. Relationships where I again sort of felt like I needed those people since my life really isn't too peoply anymore, as you know. And that made me very reluctant to become aware of some of those red flags, like just as with my father, being let down in my most vulnerable moments like not having them check in with me if it didn't suit their momentary needs, etc. When this year I finally decided that I wasn't going to initiate contact with them anymore, not for the umpteenth time try to communicate my feelings and needs, what happened was, as was to be expected, I lost those people too. And that was as necessary and healthy as it was to finally stand upright and be loyal to myself first, that was a hell of a lot for my already totally weak and emotional system. Losing all those people was painful. But what I realize is that I can be really proud of these painful processes and steps that I'm taking. And the loneliness, yes. The grief, yes. That is really hard. Especially when you're pretty much by yourself all the time. And of course that didn't leave me in a good place with my eating disorder and with the coloration of my thoughts. So... I gotta be honest, this this year, most days, it was going from gray to black. And I'm embarrassed to say I had many a day where the only thought that seemed to bring me comfort was the hope to not to wake up the next day. The torturous routine was killing me, yet I was so afraid after all the overwhelm that I experienced that I found myself unable to stop or cut myself some slack. The only thing I seem to find joy in, to this day, is my nightly binging. Which again embarrasses me a lot to admit. So of course, to keep the guilt over binging under control, as well as to give my otherwise empty days structure, the compulsive exercise. Again, the shame to admit all that. Look, I gotta be honest, my only lifeline this year was my therapist and my psychiatrist and of course my remaining few loyal friends that I wish I could see all the time, but at least I get to see them every few weeks. People that I found that I never really have boundary issues with. People I feel safe with. They are out there. They really exist. And when you're around them, you know that it's right because it just feels right. And apropos of safety, over the past few weeks, it suddenly started to make sense why, despite having all this knowledge about eating disorders and exercise addiction at my fingertips from all the wonderful interviews I was lucky enough to have, why I struggled so much with making any progress in recovery and kept falling back to my familiar routine. It just never felt safe enough to, to do anything else. And that's because I never felt safe enough inside of myself to try new stuff. From all the countless examples of how I let other people trample over my boundaries, from all the time I've walled off my pain, from all the times I've not been true to myself, from all the times I've abandoned myself, I of course didn't only have way too many toxic relationships in my life, but as a consequence I had no real relationship to me, to myself, my true self. Basically not even knowing who or how that true self could be. So of course that fundamental relationship to myself needs to be established first. With a lot of patience and self-compassion, not two of my strongest suits. But I've come to accept that okay, yes, I still have this eating disorder, but I'm working hard to build up some of that inner safety foundation, if you will, an inner refuge, rebuild the trust in myself and being proud of myself for having taken so many painful steps this year. And I know that when I'm feeling safe enough, I will be able to change. This is not about weight. This is about something fundamental. It's about me, my truth, and about safety. So here we are. You made it through the mucky part with me. Yay! And because this has been going on for way too long already, let me just quickly share my exciting slash scary 
travel plans. With all the darkness in my mind and another lonely holiday season coming up, you know, having to face all that by myself again, I suddenly realized that this would be my undoing. It just seemed unbearable. And you know what's absurd? Over the last years, I've turned into someone who's hardly able to leave her city because I'm so afraid to lose my structure or not to be able to follow through with all my fixed routines, etc. I've become a person that is so full of shame that all she does basically is hide. Hide from the world. Certainly no traveling happening in this house, as you might guess. So take that person, me, and picture me one evening sitting in front of my computer, as I do when I spend my evenings eating, and all of a sudden I literally found myself. As if something was guiding me or pulling me or making me do it, I found myself googling flights for Melbourne out of the blue. Without previous consideration of this, nothing. Just found myself googling flights for Melbourne. Consider the remarkable level of improbability right there. Not being able to go to another town in Switzerland, but googling flights to the other side of the world? Sure, totally me. Not. There's no explanation why I just did the impossible, but I did. I booked myself on a flight to spend a month over Christmas, New Year's, and almost all of January in Melbourne. And in my mind, it was clear that I finally wanted to connect to a woman that I had previously only been in contact with virtually, but I've come to love deeply for some divine reason. And somehow knowing that I would find way more people to possibly trust in Melbourne, I don't know why, than in the whole of Switzerland. You know, maybe finding people who are non-judgmental, people who know about health at every size, people who I've even interviewed, you know, like a dietitian I could possibly even trust with the specific patterns of my eating disorder. I couldn't do that here in Switzerland. I just never felt safe. And I knew there was a strong group of badass women in Melbourne. And I suddenly just thought, okay, I'm going to take my eating disorder as it is right now with me. And I'm going to trust the universe that it will guide me into the right hands, the right people, people who don't expect me to be anything else than I am right now. And I hope I will. So far, I don't have any plans yet, to be honest. So I just figured I'll share it here on my podcast. If you live in Melbourne and are up to meeting a quirky, weird, very self-conscious, slightly bonkers, but honest and funny woman, please send me a message on Messenger. I really hope I can find moments to step out of my routines and actually meet people. And it would be nice to meet up with a dietitian whom I could trust and for the first time maybe book a session with a health at every size pro. That would be lovely. But all in all, you can guess, I'm also scared shitless to go. All the what ifs in my head right now. What if I can't eat what I want? What if I can't exercise? What if people think I'm a huge disappointment? What if no one wants to meet me at all? You know, all the typical fears and they make the whole thing feel like I'm losing control. But I just know that something is guiding me and that I have to go. Staying here alone with my thoughts, not an option. And for those of you who are interested, I'll be flying into Melbourne on the 24th of December. <laughs> out of all dates, it was basically the only date that had flights left that I could pay. And I'm um, lucky to be able to say that for the first few days, I got offered the flat of this uber lovely woman I mentioned before, who lives in Williamstown. And I can sit her flat while she's away for the holidays. So for a week, I think. And after that, I will be staying on St. Kilda Street in Melbourne in an apart hotel. <laughs> and I'll be staying there until January 22nd. So another three weeks in the actual city center, I suppose, in Melbourne. And I'm really open to your messages. And I would love to come and see some of you lovely radicals. And I'm also very scared that I would be a disappointment. But let's do this. And to all of you who are listening from every other place than Melbourne, know that you are loved and wonderful and that I wish I could meet all of you. 
I wish you a merry holiday season and a hopefully grateful start into 2019. May it bring us all the new perspectives, more self-love and more healthy friendships and connections. I love you and we will meet again. This was today's dose of badassery from Life Unrestricted. Find the show notes with links to everything we mentioned in this episode over at lifeunrestricted.org. And if this show is making you feel good, awesome, make sure to subscribe and please let others feel good too. By leaving a five-star review on iTunes, you'll help make this show more visible and therefore more accessible for others. You're the best. Thanks. Thanks.